Hello everybody, welcome to this week's update video. My name is Martin and I'm an Inkscape developer and I develop features and fixes for everyday Inkscape users. Thank you for joining me on these updates where we talk about some of the work that I've managed to get up to this week, as well as some of the things going on in the rest of the Inkscape project. Uh, before we kick off into the actual work, as usual, I want to give a big thank you to all of the people that pay me to work on Inkscape. Um, it's not some big business. It's not some big money bags that gives me the time to work on Inkscape. It's you. You guys actually subscribe to my LibrePay and subscribe to my Patreon and help fund the work. This allows me to listen to your issues specifically and drive Inkscape towards a place where users actually feel the benefits. So thank you so much. Um, so to continue on from last week, um, I finished the tests for the color space um, transformation. The filter stuff is all done. There's a macOS building issue. I think it's Clang. This is a technical thing, but it's basically it's not building for macOS. I'm going to need some help from one of the other Inkscape developers to unpick that because I don't actually have a macOS machine myself. Um, I don't really like the conversion that I'm doing that's that's outside of LCMS2. It, uh, I have a an architectural problem between the work that I've done on the um, uh, the surface access stuff that I've been talk talking about, where you have an entire image, and the color conversion work that I did. Um, the surface stuff is all bolted down using um, fixed sized arrays, so that you know in advance, basically you know at a compile time, what uh, how many channels you're going to be dealing with. Whereas the color stuff is all dealing with vectors, so it's variable size. And so the, those two assumptions are currently butting heads. I've gotten it to work, but it involves copying data around, and so it's going to be really, really slow. This won't affect you if you're converting, say, for instance, from um, RGB, Adobe RGB, to sRGB. Um, but it will be a pro problem if you're converting to anything that requires an internal conversion, like HSL. And it may be a problem for CMYK, unless I can I can basically zip the two sur surfaces together. Um, if you remember from a previous video, the way CMYK is done, because it has four channels instead of three, um, the K is actually split off into its own surface. But in order to use LCMS2, I actually need to include... Um, I need to, to basically uh, compile all of those bytes together um, and then use LCMS2 to, to do the conversion. But uh, so for now, it's actually running through the slow method. And so I'm going to have to probably do some speed tests to compare each of the different ways of doing things. Do I make a copy first and then use LCMS2? Or do I convert it byte by byte um, using LCMS2 as one of the sections for the code? It depends. I suspect that that uh, second uh, option is probably going to be much slower. Um, okay, so let's talk about some things that's not to do with the CMYK stuff, actually, which is um, I've moved the Inkscape's pages implementation. So, okay, so if you're new, by new I mean in the past two years, then you probably don't know that I'm the developer that created the uh, Inkscape multiple pages support, right? I, I added the ability for Inkscape to support multiple pages. And the way that I did with this is that I created a custom element in Inkscape's own SVG namespace, i.e. it's not a standard, um, which defines how big a rectangle is on the infinite canvas within which your page objects exist, right? It allows you to do some um, fun things like overlapping pages and uh, the ability to have pages inside of paid pages, etc. Uh, but it has some limitations, which is that objects are never owned by pages. Uh, objects are always owned by the infinite can canvas itself, the SVG file. And so it's, it has pros and cons, right? And so because of the way SVG works and because of the way Inkscape was designed, I designed it to be uh, the the first order of um, they're essentially just rectangles that define a view into which a page is then defined. When we output it to PDF, what we do is we usually make um, copies, and sometimes and I think with the new PDF work, I actually make a single canvas in PDF and then uh, tell each of the pages that it, they, they reference the same um, the same graphic. Uh, I don't know what that will do with print shops and other things and some things that want to actually split PDFs apart, but we'll see. The bug port, the bug reports will come in. So anyway, so anyway, SVG is, it traditionally never supported um, 
pages, which is why I needed to make my own custom element. But it appears that in SVG2, there is an element called view. Uh, this is very new and is supported by web browsers. And it basically has the same idea. It's just not called pages, they're called views. And it's a rectangle on the screen, which defines a view, which uh, you can actually use the um, anchor tag um, mnemonics to 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 basically zoom in or center on a specific area of a an SVG. This includes parts of the SVG that are off the uh, primary canvas. So uh, all, all this is a long-winded explanation for the movement that I've done. I've I've moved Inkscape from using its own custom Inkscape page element to using an SVG two view element. The actual data remains exactly the same. So instead of having an X, Y width and height, it's now just a view box with this exact same four num numbers. We retain all of the Inkscape specific elements like margins and bleeds and labels. And uh, we move the element from um, Soddy Potty named view, which is an Inkscape specific thing, into the defs or the, the SVG definitions, which is a standard location. Um, when testing with a web browser, this now means that Inkscape can create multi-page documents where you can actually link between pages and those links actually work in a web browser, which is really nice. Um, it still exports to PDF and everything else that supports multiple pages in the same way because I architected the pages to be um, quite flexible in terms of like what, how the, the elements would be supported uh, with just a few minor fixes actually. Um, but the ultimate goal is to make Inkscape's SVG, Inkscape's multiple pages SVG, more standard, right? Standardization is is really, really important. So if you're thinking about creating a multi-page SVG and then opening it in, in um, GNU Imp, or you're opening it in Critter, or Blender, or Penpot, or any of these other tools, and technically, yes, also Affinity Designer or Illustrator, if they ever get it around to supporting SVG too, um, you should be able to open up multiple pages, right? Um, the tool will have to make the same leap of logic that I do, which is that a view is just a fancy way of saying page, and a, a page is just a view, right? It's just a box that is defined, and it's not a separate document. Um, but uh, assuming that that's the case, more things and viewers, editors, and other things will, will should be able to support... Uh, Inkscape pages because it's now not an Inkscape page, it's now an SVG page. Um, to aid with this, I've actually put contacts out to various other open source projects, uh, LibreSVG, uh, Penparts, and a bunch of other things to see if they will actually support the view element. Because if they do support the view element, it means that we have a much better chance of it just becoming a standard way of understanding what pages are in SVG. Right. I don't think we actually need to have separate documents for pages in SVG That's as you would in PDF land. Okay, so um, thank you for listening to that. That's a, lot, a long way to go for explaining what's going on. Um, it it does the work does include a transformation of old documents. So if you created a document in 1.4, 1.3, 1.2 with multiple pages, and open it in 1.5, it will be translated uh, when on opening into the new format. When you save those documents as 1.5, they will uh, be in the new format, which means that if you open them then up in Inkscape 1.4, the pages will disappear. That is unfortunately how it's going to have to work. But uh, it shouldn't be a problem, I hope, because 1.5 should be pretty good. Um, but just so you know that that's a limitation of the, migrating the data like this. Um, there are obviously new tests. I made sure that the, the whole thing was pretty well tested because I needed to make sure it was, um, it was ready. Uh, it's probably going to need some more rigorous testing. Big shout, shout out to, to, to Kiri17, who did some testing, found a PDF export was busted. And in a really interesting way, it was a uh, vacuum defs or, you know, clean document function. It gets run when you use the, the graphical user interface export. And it was cleaning the pages away because the page definitions are now in defs. And those defs didn't have hrefs that were linked to other elements. So it was just deleting them. And I was like, when I found that, it took me like a couple of hours to actually debug around Inkscape because it wasn't obvious what, what, what was happening. I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> so, so silly. Um, but it does appear that like it's all functioning pretty well and uh, and the tests I think help make sure that it will continue to work even if we adjust how pages work in the future 
Um, I added the variable font support to the PDF output. So Capy PDF support for fonts is improving all the time. We had a bug report that uh, variable fonts, these are where you use a an axis for weight and, and, and slant and other things that tell the font how to operate. So instead of having a category like bold and ultra bold, you just have an one axis that says how bold. Um, those variable fonts are neat, are, um, when they're exported into Kappa PDF, was just using the, the uh, zeroing them out essentially. It did require an upstream upstream change, so big thanks to Josie for adding the variable font support in Kappa PDF itself. We then had to upgrade our version uh, the, of the library that we were using from uh, 0.16 to 0.18, um, fix a few bugs with the output and the testing. <clears throat> And that's all. That's all gone well. Uh, yes, that's that's probably about it for that uh, for the output stuff. Do test more of the PDF output because it's it's going to be one of those vectors where we're going to find all of these little uh, edge cases and stuff, especially new technologies that um, might not work. Um, I created this year's uh, Inkscape Developer Survey. This is a community management operation where I basically pull all of the developers that are both active and inactive so they were active last year and they're not active this year uh, to tell us about their experiences developing for Inkscape this is so that we can actually extract valuable information about uh, whether our documentation works whether our build systems work do are there a lot of developers on Linux are there a lot of developers on Windows and Mac OS um, what is the mix up of people's rationalities for developing for Inkscape. So I ask developers whether they are just here to have fun or if they are here to um, help uh, make the world a better place or if they're paid to be here, etc, etc. And uh, what I'll do is I'll condense that down like I did with the 2024 developer survey into some analysis and I'll deliver that to the developer team and it will ho help us plan um, some preliminary find findings. I'm seeing a lot of uh, your documentation is spread out in too many place places and it, it needs to be homogenized into a single um, documentation. I think that's actually work that's actually happening right now, but it'll be good to see uh, that response so that the people that are involved in that work will have a bit of um, added uh, energy uh, to, to, to conclude it because it's, it's, it's going to be important to make sure that Inkscape is an inviting place to contribute. Um, just like I ask you guys to pay me to work on Inkscape. Um, that's not the only way of contributing to Inkscape. You can actually spend time um, doing design or programming and other tasks which are very, very valuable. Um, okay, so let's ask a quick question. Do you think I should create a survey for users? And if so, what would that ask users? about. I'm mostly interested not in, in Inkscape the tool. We already have a bug tracker and features requests and st stuff like that. It's more about how do we encourage users to become participants in the community itself, right? Like th th there's some delicate questions here about, hey, can you guys pitch in something so that we can keep this ball rolling? And what is the best way of asking for users to get involved with the community? You know, right? actually become participants rather than um, what do you call those people that watch sports? Um, yeah, and and of course it's a, it's a delicate question because in, the open source world gives away stuff for free and it has for a very very long time. Uh, but there is a question here about uh, pushing people towards helping more, right? Becoming uh, active more, for the, especially for the tools that they use for their work and tools that they're using actively to um, you know make money themselves. We need to spread that out so that developers actually have the ability to work on these tools and make them better for everybody. Um, okay, so let's get into uh, some of the things that have been happening in the Inkscape project, um, some of the other things that have been going on in the Inkscape pro project. So um, Charlotte Curtis has uh, unified the optional con content group behaviors in the PDF input work. Uh, nice work, Char Charlotte. Always great to see. Um, Mykov has added a character viewer onto the text um, text dialog. So it's basically a little pop down that shows you all of the different characters in a font. Uh, very, very useful work and very pretty. Uh, Iron Das fixed some shape builder pro problems. These are when you would cancel the shape builder, but it, some of the things would still be semi transparent. 
Um, Vibe have has been fixing a bunch of different issues with live path effects, uh, refactoring some things, fixing a bunch of uh, crashes and things. This is always delicate work, but I'm really excited about Vibe have getting experience with how live path effects are structured because the more people we have who are experienced with that work, the better it'll be in the future when we come to refactor it entirely. Um, Ryan from last week got his drop shadow primitive uh, merged with a bunch of fixes uh, from the reviewer. Uh, nice work, Ryan. And Willie has been fixing a whole bunch of um, user experience issues with Inkscape. Um, you know, lots of little, little margin issues, um, some widgets that needed centering, you know, small things that you wouldn't think are as important, but actually like they, they add up and they make Inkscape just a little bit prettier, um, more balanced. Um, he also fixed the polka dot pattern. Um, so, you know, this, the, he, he made it so that the polka dot pattern could actually acquire the color from the, um, from the dialogue, right? So it, it was a, it was a, so a patterns come in two flavors, i.e. they're already colored or they can be colored. And so he, he made the polka dot pattern, uh, so that it can be colored. And, um, and that wasn't even a programmer, uh, contribution. That's just like a editing the SVG, uh, pattern, uh, pattern SVG to like fix it. Okay, so that's everything that's been going on in the Inkscape project. Um, thank you for watching this update video. I hope to see you again next week. Uh, let me know in the comments how you think we're doing, um, some ideas that you might have for Inkscape. And um, also, I'd like to see what kind of things you're ma making in Inkscape. I always love, lo love to see these things. And have a great week.